Good morning. We're going to be in Acts chapter 18 today. As we continue here as Paul leaves Athens and heads over to the city of Corinth. Now, if you've read the books in the Bible of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, you know that the church in Corinth had some challenges, which really is no surprise because the city itself had some challenges, but it was a large city and a massive city, a city that, frankly, had lots of oppositions to the gospel within it. And yet, as we'll see here, the Lord desired for Paul to spend quite a bit of time there. So let's read in Acts chapter 18, uh, verses 1 through 17 today. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names in your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Galileo paid no attention to any of this. Let's thank the Lord for his word. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is truth. We thank you, Lord, that you are so faithful to make yourself known, to let us know that you are indeed with us, and what a difference your presence makes. I pray today that we would be eager to seek you, to recognize you, to depend upon you, Lord, that we would recognize how you are at work in our lives and we would be eager to submit to you. Help us, Lord, to respond to you today with faith. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. The city of Corinth was the major hub of all commerce surrounding the Greek mainland. The reason for this was its position near a thin strip of land connecting the northern and southern parts of what we would call the Greek mainland. This strip of land is only three and a half miles wide at its narrowest point. The distance was short enough that smaller boats could easily be loaded on carts and carried over land a short distance between the ports, and the loads of larger ships could easily be transferred back and forth. This process was much easier and safer than traveling all the way around the rest of Greece. This made Corinth the center of east-to-west trade in the region. However, all this money and goods changing hands in Corinth also resulted in Corinth becoming a hub of immorality and sin. 
In fact, even the Greeks themselves had their own word, which literally translated was to live like a Corinthian. And it meant to live in immorality. In fact, the highlight of the city at the time was a large, impressive temple that sat on a commanding perch on a 1,900-foot hill overlooking the rest of the city. This temple was dedicated specifically to the Greek idol Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love and fertility. More than anything, though, this temple was actually a place of ritual prostitution built to cater to the city's wealthy population, really under the guise of some form of religious activity. All of this only further contributed to the immorality and sinfulness that truly had come to define the city of Corinth in the first century AD. However, Luke's account here focuses at first on Paul's initial connection with the Jews of the city, particularly a couple named Aquila and Priscilla a couple that became very important to Paul in his future travels. In fact, they are mentioned in three of Paul's other letters. And every time they are mentioned in Scripture, this couple is always mentioned together, never individually. Clearly, they were a couple who became committed to serving the Lord and working together to help further the gospel in any way they could. Luke adds, as a sort of side note here, that the couple had come to Corinth because the Emperor Claudius had kicked all of the Jews out of Rome. But while this is just a side note for Luke, it's actually an important detail for us, because it helps us date the time that Paul would have been in Corinth, because we have other historical records of Emperor Claudius doing exactly this and kicking the Jews out of Rome. Interestingly enough, the Roman historian Suetonius mentioned that Claudius kicked the Jews out of Rome over some turmoil the Jews were having, about someone that he calls Christus, or Christ. Which further shows that Paul wasn't the only person telling others about Jesus. But believers were traveling all over the Roman Empire and sharing the good news of Jesus. And it would seem that some Jewish believers, who maybe even had been in Jerusalem at Pentecost, had traveled back to Rome and were debating with the other Jews in Rome about Jesus. And the Jews were so divided there over this, and in such turmoil about it, the Emperor Claudius actually kicked them all out of the city in January of what was 49 AD. And we don't know if Paul led Priscilla and Aquila to the Lord there in Corinth, if they were already believers. But most scholars actually prefer the likelihood of the latter, believing that Priscilla and Aquila had already become followers of Christ back in Rome. And this would explain why Paul would have connected with them so quickly. Since they had a Jewish heritage uh, and they were already believers, they were probably ready and eager to help Paul spread the gospel in any way they could. Throw in the fact that they were tent makers, a trade that it would seem that Paul had also been trained in, and one can see why it was so easy for them to work closely together and why they became close friends. We know from Paul's other letters that Paul often worked alongside Priscilla and Aquila to make and sell tents in order to support himself financially so that he would not be dependent on others in any way. Priscilla and Aquila also would have had relationships with the local synagogue in Corinth, and as for his custom and preference, this is where Paul primarily went first to bear witness to the gospel. But Luke notes in verse 6, that it wasn't long before the Jews rejected Paul's message of the gospel, resulting in Paul leaving the synagogue rather dramatically and emphasizing that he had done what the Lord had called him to do in bringing the gospel to them. But since they had rejected it, he says, their blood was on their own hands. And from there, Paul focused his attention on witnessing to Gentiles. However, Luke notes that Paul stayed with a man with a very Roman name, Titius Justus, who happened to live right next door to the synagogue. And a man named Crispus, who had been the ruler of the synagogue, well, he and his entire family actually came to believe in the Lord. So even though Paul had left the synagogue and may have never even formally entered it again, the Jews would have seen Paul daily 
witnessing to the Gentiles right outside and down the street for the next year and a half. And Luke simply notes there at the end of verse 8 that many Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. So despite this city's reputation and the immorality that was so common within it, the Lord was working in incredible ways to draw people to him. But realize that for the most part, Paul had not stayed in any one place on these missionary journeys for a very long. Everywhere he had been up to this point, it only took a few days to at most a couple months before someone got upset and threatened Paul, attacked Paul, or ran Paul out of town. This is why the vision Paul gets from the Lord and the message the Lord gives him in verses 9 and 10 is so important. Because by this point, Paul had to be thinking, man, you know, any day now, someone's going to come around that corner, some group of Jews are going to come out of that synagogue, and they're going to try and kill me or arrest me or something. The Jews were already plenty upset with him. And who knows whose questionable business activities may have been threatened by the spread of the gospel, like what had happened in Philippi, or lives being changed for Christ that had thrown families or leaders out of whack. Maybe Paul was getting nervous, or maybe just assuming he needed to hit the road soon and move on to somewhere else. Whatever it was, the Lord intervened and made it clear that Corinth was where the Lord wanted Paul to stay. As Paul had this vision of encouragement, I like to call it, from the Lord. And it's interesting because it's quite similar in terms of what is said to visions that several other men in the Old Testament, guys like Moses and Joshua and Jeremiah received. When they too were encouraged not to be afraid, not to be silent, but to know that God was with them and that God would keep them safe. The Lord here doesn't just command Paul not to be afraid, but he explains why Paul doesn't need to fear and has every reason to go on continuing to boldly share the gospel with the people in Corinth. And the primary point of encouragement is quite simply, I am with you. God was with Paul. He was present. Paul was not alone. The Almighty God was always right there with him. Now, the implication of the phrase implying not just that the Lord happened to spiritually be in Paul's general vicinity, it's more than that, but that God was with Paul here for a purpose, for a reason. And this is why God's presence makes all the difference in the world. You know, there are some people in this world that when they say they have an idea or a plan, Others around them stop what they are doing, and they're eager to listen and to hear. But there are other people in this world that when they announce that they have an idea or a plan, most people around them begin to groan or roll their eyes or maybe even duck for cover because those around them have personally experienced some of those ideas and plans and aren't interested in sticking around to see what's coming next. And you know, we have all had plans of our own that came to nothing. Ideas that didn't work out exactly as we thought they would. Purposes in our actions that really just didn't pan out. For frankly, we aren't nearly as remotely in control of things as we like to imagine we are. But here's the thing. God has never had a bad idea. God has never made a plan that isn't perfect. God has never had a purpose that he hasn't carried through to completion. If God is with us for the sake of his purposes, for the sake of his gospel and his glory, then he is absolutely going to see it through. And nothing and no one can stand in his way. God isn't with us randomly or accidentally. He isn't with us because he has nothing better to do. He's with us for the sake of his glorious, wonderful, gracious, and compassionate purpose in our lives. So when God says, don't be afraid and don't be silent because I am with you, know that there is no greater guarantee that you can be given 
than the guarantee of the purpose of the presence of God Almighty. And in Paul's case, the Lord even gets more specific in explaining how the Lord was going to protect Paul and how the gospel would surely advance in this city. As the Lord promises Paul, no one will attack you or harm you. No one. He's saying, Paul, you don't have to look over your shoulder anymore. You don't have to worry about how someone may respond to your message. The Lord is basically telling Paul, I got this. You don't have to worry about this one. I'm protecting you. You just go be a witness. Just preach my word. And then the Lord adds, for I have many in this city who are my people. Which is a fascinating statement, which has been inter interpreted a few different ways over the years. But what I believe the Lord is emphasizing here is that as Paul is speaking and his sharing of the gospel is going to bear fruit in the city. The Lord isn't saying that there are already a bunch of Christians in Corinth and thus it's a safe place to speak about Jesus. For frankly, we already know the opposite to be true. Paul's safety here isn't coming from other men, but from the presence of the Lord. But instead, God is saying, I know all things. I've already seen tomorrow, and there are many here who belong to me. Those who likely Jesus spoke of back in John chapter 10, when Jesus said, they are my sheep. They just haven't heard my voice yet. But when they do, they will follow the good shepherd. God is telling Paul that the harvest here is ready, and that the Spirit is already working, preparing hearts to respond. Paul just needs to be faithful to share the good news, and the good news will surely bear fruit. People will respond, and the church in Corinth will surely grow. The Lord guarantees the purpose of his presence with Paul. He guarantees Paul's personal safety, and then he even guarantees that Paul's labor and service in the Lord will not be in vain but will surely result in people coming to know and follow Christ. Now, can you put together a greater guarantee than that? You know, the assurance the Lord gives here resulted in Paul staying a year and a half in Corinth, witnessing and making disciples for what was for Paul truly an extended period of time. As this says, again, most places he went, he was only there for a few days or weeks. But to emphasize here that the Lord kept his word to Paul, Luke adds one quick account of a time in Corinth where the Lord protected Paul. When the Jews finally became so fed up with Paul, living next door to their synagogue and telling so many people about Jesus, that they grabbed him and brought him before the regional tribunal and pro-council, which were located there in Corinth. But their charges against Paul were so vague and clearly were religious instead of violent or even social in nature that it resulted in the pro-council Galileo throwing them all out of court. An act that obviously made quite the scene and was embarrassing to the Jews, and it would appear that a mob outside of the tribunal mocked Sosthenes, the Jewish synagogue ruler, and beat him in the street in front of the building. Not exactly the outcome the Jews had been hoping for. But as a quick side note here, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians begins in chapter 1, verse 1, mentioning a believer named Sosthenes, leading many to wonder if this very synagogue ruler, who was beaten ultimately, became a believer himself and came to serve alongside Paul in his mission work, which would also explain why Luke would have considered this particular event worth noting here and why Paul would have mentioned him in his letter. All of this only further emphasizes how much God was entirely and completely at work in Corinth, protecting his people and opening doors for the gospel to spread. And remember, what was at this time considered one of, if not the most, immoral city in the world. But you know, that's the difference the presence of God makes. When God is working for the sake of his purposes in our midst, then we, as those who belong to him, when we submit ourselves to not just acknowledging him, but actually, faithfully, and persistently depending upon him and his presence with us, 
we see the Lord work in marvelous ways for the sake of his glory and name. I think the issue, though, is we know up here in our minds that God is with us. If you're a believer, you've probably been told this many times. God is with you. But it's one thing to hear that God is with you. It's another to live each moment dependent on the presence of God instead of the faculties of your own self-awareness, your own strength, and your own ideas. Plenty of men throughout the course of history have announced that their plans will surely succeed because God is with them. But their plans are just that. They're their plans. And they have never actually taken the time, let alone applied the faith required, to humbly and prayerfully seek the Lord. Seeking to know the Lord's plans for them, and then submit themselves to the Lord's purposes instead of their own. Realize, church, we gain little when we go to God asking Him only to bless our own purposes, our own ideas, or even just our own efforts, in order that our plans may succeed. You know, God can certainly choose to bless our plans, to bless such things of men, if he sees fit. But realize, he is under absolutely no obligation whatsoever to do so. But know that when we go to the Lord, seeking to know him and his purposes, with hearts desiring to know where he is present, where he is working, and what he desires of us, then and only then are our hearts ready to trust in the promise, I am with you. Because you see, God isn't with us so that he can follow us. We aren't the leader in this game, nor do we truly know where we are going or how best to get there. God is with us so that we can follow him. So that he can lead us into all that is holy, righteous, glorious, and good. God's presence makes all the difference because God is always present for a purpose. But realize that also means that his presence won't mean much to us if his purpose doesn't. If we don't care about his purposes for us because we're too busy wrapped up in our own. So, have you asked him? Have you gone to the Lord and asked him why he is with you? What's the purpose of his presence in your life? Have you taken time to seek him in prayer and his word? Do you depend upon his presence with you each and every day? Because he is with you. You are never alone. He is always there. Do you recognize his presence? Do you trust his presence? Or are you too busy leading your own life, your own way? You know, when we are seeking the Lord, then there is nothing greater than trusting in the assurance of the presence of God. But when we are seeking something else, well, we tend to ignore God's presence as we are too busy with ourselves and the things of this world. So what are you seeking today? Are you hoping God will follow you and bless your plans? Or are you following him as he leads you forward in his purposes, his plans, and his will? Let's pray. Lord, I pray today that we would recognize that we too are not alone, but that you are with us, that your spirit is here with us today. God, I pray that you would grant us the humility and faith and the courage and faith to seek you to seek you and your plans for us, to trust and submit to you, that we would not be so busy with our own ideas that we miss that you are with us and why you are with us. Lord, thank you for being with us. Thank you for encouraging us. Thank you for equipping us to follow you, to honor you, to worship you, and to obey you. Lord, we need you. Help us to depend upon your presence today. In your name we pray. Amen. 
Go in the grace and peace of Christ and depend on the Lord's presence with you this week.